God, because it was your breath that woke us up this morning. It was your love that woke us up this morning. It was your love that kept us through the night, Father God. So we thank you for that. We honor and praise you for that. We lift your name up. You're highly exalted. You're the supreme God. You're the sovereign God. You're the God of all the heavens. You're the God of all the earth. You're the God of all creation, Father God. So we thank you, all other gods sitting at your feet, make us bow before you, Lord, because you are the name that's above all names, and at that name, every tongue must confess and every knee must bow that you are God, that you are the one and only true living God. So we thank you on this day, Father God, that you chose us, that we are in you, Father God, and because we in you, we reign supreme over everything that is not like you. So we bless and praise your name on this day, Father God. We exalt you. We honor you. We worship you. We lift your name up. We adore you. We magnify you. We exalt you. You're the one and only true living God. We thank you, Father God. You're the God of our peace. You're the God of our joy. You're the God of our faithfulness. You're the God of our kindness. You're the God of our peace. You are a promise keeper. Your word cannot return void. So we thank you, Father God, for keeping your word, Father God. We thank you that your word is inside of us. You are the living word. It's active, Father God. It's quick. It's powerful. Shoveling any two-inch sword. Separating the spirit and the soul. So we thank you, Father God, that our spirit resides inside of you and your spirit resides inside of us. So on this day, Father God, we come against every plot and every plan and every scheme of the enemy. He is diabolized. He is the one who accuses our name, Father God. But we're thankful that we are the brethren, that we have been chosen, that we've been identified, that we've been marked for life, Father God, that your DNA is inside of us, that we are one whole new man and one whole new woman. We are a new creation in you, Father God. So in this day, we ask you to untangle every entanglement, Father God. We ask you we speak to every mountain, and it must come down. You're the God of our mountains. You're the God of our valleys. You make crooked paths straight, Father God. So in this day, we're walking in the newness of life. Be a lamp into a feet and a light into our path, Father God. So we thank you for your healing power. We thank you for your delivering power. We thank you for your quickening power. We thank you for making us complete in you. We thank you that we are whole in you. And we thank you, Father God, that we look like you. That we represent you in the earth, Father God. We thank you that you shine your light in the deep, dark places and brought us into your marvelous light. We thank you for your grace. Your grace that's so amazing. Your mercies that are new every single day. So we thank you, Father God, for taking the scales off our eyes so we can see your glory, Father God. We thank you that we have access to you to come boldly to your throne of grace to come sit at your feet. So on this day, Father God, let the power of your spirit move in this place. Let the authority of your spirit move in this place. Fill every empty spot and fill every wounded spot in Jesus' name. Reveal every secret. Reveal every hidden thing because you exposed and you reveal to heal. So on this day, healing is your portion. On this day, deliverance is your portion. On this day, power is your portion. On this day, authority is your portion. Every provision is made. We speak prosperity into your life, Father God. So we bless you yes, yes, on this day. Yes, on this day, for this yes, is the day that you have made. Yes, you not only chose this yes, day for us, but you chose it for you, Father yes, God, God, to advance your kingdom yes, and to plunder the gates of hell, yes, Father God. So right now we close every door. Yes, we close every window, Father yes, God. Every interest rate, every debt, Father God, that has been given access to the enemy, we shut it down now. In Jesus' name, Father God, let your spirit consume us. Let us walk in the overflow of you, Father God. We want to bask in your presence. We want to bask in your glory. We recognize our need for you. Because without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. So we expect to do all things. Because those who know their God shall do great exploits. So we come to do great exploits in your name. By the power of your spirit, Father God, we thank you, Jesus. We honor you on this day, Father God. Open up the hearts and minds of your people, that we may hear what thus saith the Lord, that when we leave this place, we will experience another level of you, and we will experience you like we never experienced before, because you are an infinite God. So we trust you on this day. We acknowledge you on this day. And so shall it be. Your word is yes and amen. 
Yes. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you. Come on, give God a hand to pray. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we bless you, Father. Yes, Lord. Okay, our announcements this morning. Of course, Sunday service here at 11 o'clock every Sunday. No Sunday school children's church for the month of July. We will continue the live stream Tuesday night Bible study via Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Yeah. Grace and Mercy Ministries, prom night, 2020. Yeah. This Friday, yeah. 7 from, from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at the Eagles Boardroom at 329, at 329 North Cameron Street, Manchester, Virginia. The night includes buffet dinner, desserts, Prom and Queen King Crowning Fellowship and Dance and Live Music by DJ Mark Kennedy. Tickets are $25 for singles, $45 couple. Reserve your ticket right now. Cash, card, or check. We still do cash here. <laughs> <laughs> Grace and Mercy Ministries, seven year church anniversary. Amen. Giving praise to God, 11 a.m. service, fellowship, food, come celebrate with us. That will be uh, July the 19th at 11 a.m. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I already spoke to most of y'all, but good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't usually do this, but I want to ask y'all, can we stand today? Stand today for the worship. Amen. Somebody give me a good clap. Thank you for going. Amen. I'm not afraid of the darkness anymore. I'm holding fast to the grace I never end. Every step, every step I take, you're leading me on when I hear your name. I can't help but fall on my knees. Hallelujah. No one can contain, no one can be cold. Hallelujah. Your love has corruption, my heart overflows. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed, had a loss no words. You have overtaken my life, and now I'm yours. Every step I take, you're leading me on when I hear your name. I can't help but fall on my knees. Hallelujah. No one can contain, no one can be born. Hallelujah. Your love that's corruption, my heart overflows. Trials and troubles in love will go on, for even my weakness is strong. Not death nor disaster will keep me from you, and I'm not, I'm not afraid, afraid anymore. To try yours. Trials and troubles in love will go on. For even my weakness is strong. 
Spirit in this place, oh God. We sense you now, God, knocking on our hearts, oh God, and filling this place, oh God, and shifting this atmosphere, oh God. And we say, have your way, oh God, in our lives, oh God. Have your way, sweet Holy Spirit, in our lives, God. Do what you will. Father, we give you the honor and the glory, oh God. We count it as a privilege to be able to worship you, oh God. We're forever thankful, God, for you choosing us before the foundation of this world, oh God, that we may be the sons and daughters and grafted into your family, oh God. God, we honor you at this time, oh God. We give you reverence, oh God. We Lift you up, God, for your word says, if you be lifted up from this earth, you will draw all men unto you, oh God. God, use your drawing power, God, as we lift you up, oh God. As a matter of fact, I declare that we're coming up in God, even at this moment, as he penetrates our hearts and minds and renew a right spirit inside of us. Change is taking place right now. Even as we speak, God, and so we thank you for chains, oh God, for breaking sack, for breaking cycles, patterns, and chains off our life, oh God. The chains of our mind, oh God, the things that kept us bound into our past, oh God. We thank you right now in the name of Jesus, oh God, for setting us free, oh God, from sickness and death, oh God, from all the things that had us bound, oh God, from self hate and self loathing oh God. We thank you, oh God. Hey. Hey. I love you. I love you. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, 
We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Yes, God. Open my eyes to see your So for you. Hey, we want to hear your voice, God. God, we got to hear a word from you, oh God. That may change the trajectory of our lives, oh God. We present our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, God. God, have your way, God. Have your way, God. Our eyes are focused on you, oh God. Our hearts are passed towards you, oh God. We desire you, God. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We need to drink. Hey. We need a friend. Yes, God. A friend of God. All the things new, God. You make all things new, God. We walk in our newness, our next. Hey. Shit. Hey, we declare ourselves unstuck. <laughs> unstuck. Yes, God. <laughs> Press into the mark of the high calling. We thank you, God, for divine momentum. Yes. <laughs> and suddenly that's happening in our life, oh God. Now faith. <laughs> yes, God. Have your way. Have your way. Gotta figure out how to do this. <laughs> have your way. He is good, so good. Yes, God. He is good, so good. He is good, He's good. so good. Yes, God. He is good, yes, God. so good. Yes, God. So good. Yes, God. He is good, so good. Hey. He is not so good to me. Yeah. He is not yeah. so good. He is not yeah. so good. He is not so good yeah. to me. Yes. He is not so good. Yes. He is near so to the broken heart. He God is said, I have heard so your cry. I have heard your petition. I have seen your suffering. And I'm here to deliver you from all your trials. <laughs> For all the things that you've been entangled in, I break it right now by the authority of Jesus Christ. And I loose you. I say, woman, thou art loose. Man, there are loose in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for revealing that we may be healed, oh God. And even as we tap into this message called secrets, oh God, we give you glory and honor, oh God. We give you reverence, oh God. And so it's with a great heart and great grace that we handle this delicate situation of secrets, oh God. But our intention is always to dismantle the works, the schemes, and the plot of the enemy, oh God. As we move forth, oh God. So we say, have your way, oh God. Have your way, oh God. So as we transition into the word of God that I believe God has given us, that I believe is a very powerful word. I like to go over some things that I said on last week that I, so they may be familiar, but I just want to lay the 
foundation to part two, and hopefully uh, we can get through this. And so one of the things I said is that in the beginning of last week was it's a false narrative that if you share your experience or what has transpired in your life, that you are attacking your abuser or the accuser and you don't love the person. And so I say that's a false narrative. Oftentimes we love those people. Oftentimes they're people that's close to us. And when we share our experience, it's just a sign that we want to be free. <laughs> it's just a sign that I want to be free from my past and from the things that has burdened me down. And my intent is not to shame or to blame, but to get free. <laughs> Last week I gave us an example of my mom and how I wrote the book, and it may seem like to some people that like to uh, keep secrets or deem some things taboo that I was talking about my mother, but I, my mother was in the story, but the story was about my life and my experience. And so it wasn't really, uh, if, if you focus on my mom, then you miss the point. You, you, you actually missed the point because what I was showing you, the effects of trauma and how I suffered and, my, and, and how I uh, came out, that was the theme of the story. It wasn't about uh, who did what and, and how it happened, but it was about uh, things that happened and it took hold of my life, how that looked and how God brought me out and my process of coming out. And so I can say I do have a relationship with my mom, so if you're wondering, we have, I seen her last week. She called me two days ago. She'll be here next week for two weeks. And so uh, the thing is not like we, we trying to attack the people who attacked us. Uh, many of you know my father passed. And we're talking about secrets. Secrets that we keep for a long time. And the week that my father passed, the people that's uh, the leaders here know this because I have messages when my father was still alive. Uh, he and the week that he passed, he began to talk about things that happened 25 years ago between him and I. And he said, I wanted to apologize. He wanted to apologize and make amends because he told me he had never apologized. And this is something that happened 25 years ago. And I let him know that, hey, man, I wouldn't change a thing. God got me. God got me. I wouldn't even change uh, how hurt I was or the experience that I prayed. Man, it was a design. It was a, it was a divine hookup and setup to get me to this place. And so I let them know that, hey, 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 it's all good with me and I still love you and I respect you uh, and I forgive you and I don't hold a grudge. And then my father said this to me. He said, yeah, but I'm ashamed. He says, I'm ashamed. And I went on to tell him about how being ashamed is an enemy from the inside. It's not how people perceive you or, or, or how they look at you. It's what you feel about you. And so it's an inside job when you say you're ashamed. But the point of it is that he's been carrying this thing for 25 plus years. Still ashamed, but we've been around each other many times. We didn't laugh together. <laughs> Hey, we didn't celebrate it together. And he still had this thing that he was ashamed about and didn't release it until the week he died. Didn't release it until you're talking about weight. You're talking about guilt. You're talking about isolating. Didn't release it until the week he died. And so he was secretly suffering up until the week he died. Now, I'm going to share a couple things, and people might call it risky. But I live in a risky situation. God, what God done in me is out there on the limb. Everything I do is I do by faith. And he may not call you like that, but for me, he makes me uncomfortable every day. And he, and he gives me something that I don't want to do every day. And so I'm going to say some things, right? I may say some things. It's about my experience and my life and my family. And I'm not talking about them, but I want to learn. My goal is to learn about it. You know, like you can't even discuss it. You can't even, you just don't even bring it up. Well, how do we move forward if we don't acknowledge what happened in the past? 
How you don't move? Well, we're gonna be stuck. You tell them what we want to change, but we ain't we gonna nobody gonna say that. And so I made this statement. I found a lot of journal that my dad had wrote about himself. <laughs> and then I found this. I found this. This is what it said. This is my father wrote. He wrote, as a young kid, I didn't really come to know God until I was eight years old. This is what he wrote. You see, my parents wasn't very religious people, so I got to know God from a lady in a storefront named Mrs. Spring. And the lady loved me like I was her very own. Being so young gave me no concept of time. I would venture to say that maybe six months later, she died. And along with her death, I figured that God had died with her. This is my dad. Was right. Now, this is where the risky part comes in. To me, this speak a whole lot. To me, it says a lot to me, even though I wasn't there. First of all, he got a benchmark point. He understood that he was eight years old, and he understood that he didn't see God in his family. I ain't talking about the bad. I ain't talking about the bad. But what I'm saying is, he's saying that I didn't see God in my house. And when I felt low, it won't inside my I ain't talking about no bad. But he said, I found love from the lady at the store. I ain't talking about the bad. I know people will be mad. But I'm just telling you from this is what I see. And then he said this. And when she died, God died. When she died, God died. I ain't talking about nobody. And I know family won't want to address this, but this tells me that something was going on. This happened to say, and something was going on. He was feeling this way, but something, even, even if it was delusion or whatever, something was happening in that place that he remembered that age, he remembered that lady, and he knew he didn't identify his parents with God. I ain't talking about nobody. Did I say that? <laughs> I want to say that because that's just my grandmama, right? And she introduced me to God. I don't even know her. All I know is she was saved. Same woman, two different experiences. Because your experience was one way and we was under the same house. It don't mean that my experience had to be the same thing. <laughs> and it isn't. And it's okay. I can, I can mirror that to my house. If my son begin to tell his story and it includes some of the stuff that I've done when he was young, I can't get mad at him for sharing his experience when his experience was his experience. But when him and Michaela get together, they got two different stories. They got two different narratives. And it's okay. Because he knew me one way, and she knew me a whole nother way. And so it's not like we attacking the person. We just acknowledging what happened and how it impacted me, how it affected me, and how I still struggle. And I realize that we all fall. We all fall. We all got a pay. And so I can't get mad because what it shows is that God has brought me a long way. <laughs> so the story shows that from this son to this daughter, God has done some work. And so it's not to attack a person. It's not to go against a person. It's only to share my experience. Because God healed to reveal. He reveals to heal. And we reveal to heal. We share. And so what I said was it was a code of honor within the family of silence to keep you sick in an attempt of keep, uh, keeping the family name good. What's the good of listen, what's the listen, the Bible says this, listen, what shall a man gain, what shall a man profit to gain the whole world 
and to lose his soul. What should, what should I gain? Listen, what should I benefit from if you keep a good name and I'm dying? I'm struggling. And I can't talk about it. And so God told me this this week. He said, don't be loyal to dysfunction. This is what he told me. He said, don't be loyal to dysfunction. He told, I was at work. He told me that. Don't be loyal to dysfunction. Right? And so I looked up dysfunction and what part of the definition said this. A behavior pattern that undermines the stability of a social system. It ain't working. We're not connected. We're not stable. And it's a pattern. It's a cycle. And we don't do nothing about it, right? It's dysfunction. And so I can be loyal to you, but not to your dysfunction. He said, I can be loyal to you as a person, but when it comes to uh, uh, issues and things and hangups, I can let you know about it. I'm loyal to you, but not to the foolish. I'm loyal to you, but I'm not going to stay sick. I'm loyal to you, but I'm not going to act like nothing happened. He said, because this will compromise the stability of, of our social engagement, our social system, pretending like it ain't an issue. <laughs> the great pretend. And so I say this, I just want to be free. I just want to be free and these secrets are suffocating me. They suck and suffocate me. And so I said, historically, families haven't created a safe space to say what's eating us alive. I was reading my interested. About, my dad had a book. It called it's called the psychology of a black a black child. Didn't this one stuff? He had that on his dresser. Right? I picked it up and I've been reading it. And it was talking about the development of a kid. It's talking about specifically African Americans, but it's kids in the general. It's talking about how uh, creating a safe space in our environment will contribute to the development and growth of a person, of a child, giving them the ability to take risks, right? Giving them the ability to, to be free and to explore. And, I, and so it was talking about this safe space would determine if a child feels safe, it would determine if they're healthy, emotionally healthy, or, or, or not. And so we're stuck in families that we don't want to address nothing, won't create a, a safe space so that we can grow emotionally, so that we can grow spiritually, and so that we can ultimately be set free. And so I said they want us to stop drugs, and they want us to stop sleeping around, they want us to get rid of that eating disorder, they want us to uh, stop spending the whole, they want us to stop the behaviors, but they don't want us to address the issue. Huh? And so they want, to, they want us to stop, but they don't want to talk about it. So nobody want to talk about it because they think we're talking about grandma. They think we're talking about uncle. They think we're talking about. But I'm talking about the problems, how it hurt me, man. How it hurt me, how it affected me, how it impacted me, man. How I struggled because of that thing, man. How I couldn't even connect to my peers in school because I was scared and I didn't try. I just want to talk about. I want to talk about how. It hurt me. I just want to get it out. But I want to confess what happened so that I may be healed, right? I need to talk about this, man. You don't gotta agree to it. You don't gotta, you don't gotta co-sign that. But I need to say something, man, because this thing has had me and changed it back. I was locked up way before I was locked up. <laughs> hey. And so they want to smile. And smile. Talk about stay connected to the family, blood, parody, blood, the folk, all that. I didn't want to say all this funny stuff, but we killing each other. <laughs> we kill, we emotionally killing each other. We spiritually killing each other, right? We shutting each other down. Anytime somebody want to say something, they want to shut us down. Well, don't be talking about my mama. Don't talk about grandma. There was good people. So what? There was good people. There were flawed people, right? And they can't even listen. And they stay playing look, a part in my issue. And I still love them. I still love them. I can love them and still talk about what happened. Huh? I can talk about what happened. I know your mom and my mom are the same mom. I ain't talking about your mom. I'm talking about my mom. Your mom was good. My mom was called me some trouble. Same mom. And it's okay. 
It's okay. So listen, Joe, you're talking to you. Uh, no, I see you right here. I see you, so I got to say, yeah, and so listen, it's okay if I made some problems, I made some issues, some mistakes, if I've done some things wrong, and my children, whether it's three, five, or seven, all of them see me different, right, right, because at times I was psychotic, and I was different, I wasn't, and it ain't his fault that I was different, that's my issue. But I recognize that I caused them trouble. And I still want to let them know I love them. You get that, man? And so I'm not going to feel bad if they tell somebody, man, my daddy did this, my daddy did this. That's the truth. I'm mad enough. If I say I got God, I got I to gotta do to the truth, man. And so I got to acknowledge in the front, acknowledge. What I done, or where I caused, or, or how I said something, or how I did something, and how it impacted their life, bro. I love you, boy. I love you, boy. And so I'm okay. Yeah, let's give God a hand, God. <laughs> Y'all okay, right? We're talking about secrets. I'm gonna try to move fast. We're talking about secrets. And so, for most of us, as that's in the family, most of us are part of the part of the problem. Rather than a solution, we we enable enable and dysfunction to prevail by staying silent, by not saying nothing, and then we don't have to listen. We don't have to be argumentative and all that, right? We don't got to snap our head and put our finger, but we can share what we've been through. We can share how it affected us, and it ain't you made me this. No, but it's when you did this, I felt this way. Right? When you said that, it made me feel like you didn't love me. Or I felt like you didn't love me. They didn't make you, but this is how I perceived it. This is how I took it. This is how it impacted me when you did this. Huh? And so we can address those things. We want to be part of the solution rather than the problem. And so when we talk about trauma, we talk about it, let's talk about like for decades, current decades of that stuff. My dad said eight, he was 67, 68 when he passed. And he's talking about something when he's eight years old. Do you understand that, it had to, it's, that that means something? That means something. I'm 68 and I'm talking about when I was eight. That means there was a pivotal point in my life, right? That was the first benchmark. I don't remember one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But at eight, I remember getting a glimpse of God from somebody outside of my family. Huh? That says a lot to me. You said, but we ain't talking about him, right? And so he carried those things. Those things tormented him, right? Because guess what? Brothers and sisters, they don't want to talk about. It. You talk about mom, we don't talk about dad. We get number one dad, we don't get number one mom. You know what I'm saying? No, 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 no. Mama's been good. You better not talk about mom. Well, mama caused me some issues, man. As a matter of fact, when I go around mama now, I still get triggered sometimes. That's why I don't go around too much. I love mama, but I love me now. And I know how mama pushed my buttons, right? I'm the only one that is. I know how dad pushed my buttons, right? I know how this happened. And I love him. But I can be honest. <laughs> I can be honest, right? Especially if they ain't nothing has changed, right? That's okay, nothing has changed. But I recognize nothing has changed with you, so I set boundaries. <laughs> I set boundaries, right? I set times that I can see them. Huh? I think about when they can come over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I be honest with y'all? Huh? Saturday ain't a good day because I don't want my day to be messed up. They can come Monday after work. Huh? Yeah. Can I talk about it? I mean, this is the truth, though, man. Right? This is the truth. I only can take her in doses, right? Small portion. Or that's how I overdo Huh? Just a little bit at a time. She raw. He's raw, right? They too. That's, that's here, here, now. But I love her, right? I ain't trying to change him, but I got to protect myself. 
I got to protect myself. I got to protect myself emotionally, spiritually, mentally, right? I got to protect myself. Because if I'm not good to myself, I would be no good to my kid. And everything I am doing like, and go through, my kids feel. My kids see. Right? And so I can't even be mad at my kids, man. The, what's happening in their life? Y'all gonna be mad at me if I say that? Okay. Okay, I'm saying to you this. She said I can say it, right? Yeah. And so what's happening in their life, right? Right? I can acknowledge that I played a part in that. I can acknowledge, I can acknowledge that, right? I can say, like, this is a result of partly or mostly a result of what I went through. Right? Right? What I went through. It ain't totally all my fault, but I played a role in that because I was sick. Right? Listen, and I was sick because mama was sick. Hey, I was sick because mama was sick. Y'all get what I'm saying? And so it's become, it's been passed down, right? This function has been passed down, right? Why? Because we ain't addressing it. Nobody said that. I was thinking the other day, I'm going to move forward because I'm getting out of time. I was thinking the other day, I remember the earliest thing I knew of mental health, and they didn't even call it mental health was aunt such and such had a nervous breakdown. Such and such had a nervous breakdown. They can't say a nervous breakdown, right? Like, and so listen, when I get older and I go to the clinic, they ask me do I got any mental health in my family. That's what I said. No, nobody, nobody, I'm not gonna have nobody, no, 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 right? Everybody in my family had nervous breakdowns, right? So, they don't know. We call it nervous breakdown, but that's the middle of hell. That's the hell we said we don't have a mental health problem. Well, because we got cold language, right? So, nobody want to admit that uh, people had issues and still have issues. That's how God talked to me, God. I'm gonna move on. So, I use the scripture in James 5 16. Confess your faults once to another uh, and pray with one another that you may be healed. And so this is our thing, man. We gotta we can't be quiet, you can't be silent, you can't isolate. You're gonna have to tell somebody, right? The communication will be key to you being free. The communication will be key to you coming out, right? You know, and I know once you decide to disclose your secret, your emotions, you're gonna be emotionally a wreck, right? Like all kind of emotions gonna come. Anger. Uh, shame, guilt, hurt, pain, and sadness, grief. That's some come flooded up. But if you can push past the emotions, you'll be set free. You'll be set free, right? And so, let's move on. I talked about cognitive dissonance, right? And it refers to a situation involving conflict of attitudes, beliefs, behavior. This produces a feeling of mental discomfort leading to an alteration in one's attitude, beliefs, or behaviors to reduce the discomfort and restore balance. And so this is one of the ways this compliance forced behavior, right? We're talking about when someone is forced to publicly or outside do some things that they privately really don't want to do, right? A dissonance uh, has been created, right? And so what I believe, my belief system and my behavior not matching up, and, and I don't understand, and it's confusing me. It's, it's separating, right? And so what I'm thinking and what I believe has to match up with what I'm doing. Or if, it's, if I do this over a prolonged amount of time, my mental health will be impacted negatively because I'm believing one thing and I'm doing another thing. Y'all get that, right? Y'all get that. And so, and so some of us, I believe, I live a secret life. I'm gonna get a chart. Someone's leaving a secret life. Not understanding that or understanding the toll it takes on our mental health. And so we be one way on Sunday or Tuesday, and all the other time we another way. Right? Now I understand the process, right? But I understand faking too. It's a difference between process and pretending. Right? If you pretend too long, you won't even know what you're doing. You, you, if you pretend too long, you won't even know where you're at, what's going on, what's true, who for you, who get, who against you. If you pretend too long, it's going to impact you negatively. And you may not come back. Your mind may not come back. 
The Bible said it this way. That's how the Bible said it. It served me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. That's how the Bible said it. That's how the Bible said it. And some of us, we think we're getting away with something, right? <laughs> but I want you to understand, but Robert like to say this. The body remembers. The body remembers. So even if nobody didn't see you, Pastor Deacon, brother, so, right? You're, it's stored in your memory. Stored in your memory and it's stored in your numbers. And so it still impact you or affect you even when you think you got away. And so sometimes the, the worst thing can happen to you is to get away with it. Right? Sometimes we think it was bad because I got locked up. But for many people, the worst thing that happened to them is that they got away. They think they got away. A lot of people serve God thinking that they get no, they get away. The thing about sin is, look, the more you do, the more you do, or the bigger it grows. The boy it get. I started off sneaking to get high. In the middle, I ain't care if my mother was right there. I saw from her. You see what I'm saying? And even if you go back, you'll stop him. And you don't want nobody to see it. But you do it a few times, you don't even care if the pastor standing right there. Because of the brother. Because you think you got away. Right? You think you got away. I think this is good. You think you got away. This is what God showed me this morning. I think I might skip a lot. God showed me this morning. That's crazy. So my dad passed away on June 20th, right? At his house. Uh, what can I say? All right. I ain't, I ain't talking about my back, but I'm going to tell you what God told me to do is it. God told me to use it. I'm like, hey, it is. be bad, but I'm going to push fast. And so he died. At his house, right? In his house, actually, this is from his house. Y'all know what this is? Anybody know what this is? No, I can't. What is it? Huh? Yeah, what did it do? They bring you back from the overdose, right? And so this right here, first of all, I'm going to say my dad had this in every room. I bought six boxes of this. For my dad's house. Every room. I don't know if he should teach to put them in every room. Because usually you yeah, just put stuff in one. But he had them in. I'm going to box it. Not even open. This right here. First I want to say. It don't save life. It cope long life. Jesus saved life. But this immediately. Once a minister in your nose. Not, it takes all the hair off your. Or the opening off your receptor. Right away. Immediately. Like instant. Right. And so. He had this in every room. Every room. Right? The potential to keep you there. I'm sitting at the table this morning. God started talking to me about this. Told me to put it in my pocket. He said, Some of us Christians use Jesus like this. We keep him close back. Look, my dad had him in every room. Every room. I mean, I say every room, every room, boxing. He can live. It's close by. Just like most of us close by Jesus. We come to church. We go to the Bible study. We keep them close, right? And it is some benefits from keeping them close because you feel bold. You feel confident because you got a hope. We sit them right here. And I feel good. If anything happens, guess what? It's right there. If I, if I feel like it's right there, I can do what I want to do. I'm going to jump out here. It's right there. And some of us got a level of boldness because we got Jesus in the vicinity. Because we, we hang around people that got Jesus already. Because we go to church, right? We're going to live off their faith. We just want to be close to them because we're going to draw for them. Right? And so we get bold. I got Jesus. We got confidence. We're doing stuff. We out there. 
Let's say when you got this, they got not playing parties. You got to know they have not playing Yeah, you know this, right? And so they get all get high as they want to get, and then when somebody go out, they hit them. Bye. Right? And so we get bold. We want to party. We want to have a knock and party. We want to see how far we can take it and get close to the edge, and then we'll see if we can come back. Huh? We're going to play with it. Right? You say, don't play with it. And so we're going to play with it. And so listen, this is what God told me this morning. He said, just like my can, Jesus being in your vicinity don't really benefit you or give you life. Guess what he said? Guess what he told me, man. He said, it got to be in you. He said, if it ain't in you, it ain't doing you no good. He said, you could be singing and die. And you could be sitting on it. And as long as it hasn't been a minister and uh, injected inside of you, you're going to die. That's what God told me this morning. Huh? And so my dad, thinking he's safe, right? I got it, boy. I know he's telling me I got it in every room. I got twelve boxes of that. I got six boxes of that. I got two. Of, look, someone was in box. Someone was out there like that. Anyway, I got. I, I'm good. I'm good. That's what most of us say. We good. I'm gonna keep Jesus on the shelf. I'm gonna keep Jesus. I'm gonna interfere with my life. I'm going to run back. I'm going to get it if I can. I'm going to pick him up. Look, grace. Grace is grace. It's grace. It's grace. Because I know I can always go back. I know I can always go back, right? As soon as I feel myself slipping too far, I'm slipping already, but too far, I'm going I'm to I'm get it. I'm going to get it. And so, when my daddy died, probably from about here to my wife, it was about three, three of these sitting right there. Like three of them, right? Right by his kitchen table. He's down right here in the living room. Right there. A false sense of security. Our hope and our security is in Jesus himself. Did I say you talking about no back? I said once, okay. I'm going to say it three more times. I don't even know my number. But anyway, listen, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Some of us risk it too much. We got risky talk. We talk and risk it to people. We're on a slippery slope by who we are around. Right? We think that we're good. We think that Jesus is going to always be there. And I got a lifesaver right there. I can always go back. It's right there. It's right there. And we die and we don't even know. We die. Like we literally die. Every day you wake up, you die. Y'all know that? Every day you wake up, it's a closer day to your death. Right? And we plan with it. We plan with our life, right? We plan with our life. And so for my father, he never made it back. Right in home. See it right now. Stuff right there. When I see that, that y'all made me sick. When I went through that, I was like, that y'all made me sick. It let me know how he was so close. So far away. How closeness won't get you in. It gotta be in you. Like, it, it gotta be in you. 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 Well, I'm about to close. 
What I want to say about the scars of childhood trauma, it affects our self-esteem, it affects if we trust people. Uh, it caused me difficulty with forming close relationships with people, really not trusting people. And so even if I had success in areas of work or whatever, I still felt disconnected from people. One of the things my dad said on, in one of his letters, he says this. He said, I don't feel connected to anybody. He said, with my significant other, my significant other sleep in other rooms. He said, my, my, he said, I want to be able to love people. That's what he said. That's an impact of trauma. That's trauma that caused you not to be able to connect with people on an emotional level, right? Where you really feel connected and tied to them. He was crying out. He was crying out. He was saying, I want to feel. Some of us develop depression, anxiety, panic attacks, OCD, eating disorder. Some of us have individual secrets. Individual secrets. We're talking about romantic, romantic uh, relationships. We're talking about getting high. We're talking about extramarital affairs, right? We're talking about people that secretly maxing out credit cards behind the people, uh, people back. And when we do this, it causes us to feel empty, right? We open up the door to the spirit of anxiety because we got a fear of people finding out what we're doing in practice. Listen, and then we begin to look at people funny like they got an issue because we want to be secretive. So we say they mad at us, but we the one acting funny because we're trying to cover something. And so, holding the secret will make you emotionally vulnerable. You'll have a fear of letting your guard down. So you'll instantly just put walls up, right? Because you got a fear of being found out. God wants you to be found out. He wants you to be exposed. He want to lift the burden of, of people knowing, right? Then we got, that's an individual secret. We got internal secrets. You know what they look like? This is what God told me. And I know this. And parents do this. And I don't want to hop on parents. But uh, parents got two, three kids. They go to each kid talking about every kid. Then they got secrets with the kid that the daddy don't know about. <laughs> or the mama don't know about. Right? And I ain't talking about good secrets. Because we got birthday presents, we got stuff like that, right? But now we talking to our kids about our spouse. Can you imagine the effect of, of the child? They gotta carry something on and they gotta hold something and they can't tell their mom. Or they can't tell their dad. Huh? I ain't talking about nobody, right? But I want y'all to know this weighs down on us. Uh, this is this is too tough for a, a ten, eight year old, a nine year old, a ten year old, a twelve year old to hold this kind of pressure that mama talking about daddy or daddy talking about mama, and I can't tell daddy, or she talking about my sister, or he talking about my brother, and I got a warning to my brother because I love my brother, but I love my mother too. But why am I in this situation? Why I'm caught in the middle? Internal secrets, man, that cause the divide between children. I know this so familiar. And so, instantly, siblings don't even like each other, not because of what they've done to each other, or but, but, but because of what a parent said. Secrets. Secrets, right? Secrets. Secrets. And so, and try to create a split Lord. I gotta have a split Lord that opened me up to a split personality. A split Lord. I gotta be this way, and I gotta be that way. I gotta agree with them, and I gotta agree with them. Family secret. 
the stuff that we can't talk about. What happens in his house, stay in his house. Keep it in the family. That's why we die. Because we've been keeping it in the family. We've been keeping it in the house. And everybody in the house is sick. But birds of a feather flock together. And we're all standing on the same point according to our illnesses. Of course, you said it all. Are you the lame, the blind, or the deaf? Are you the psychotic? Are you the are, are you the depressed? Or are you the, are like, what point are you on? <laughs> See, because we don't want to be judged. We don't want to deal with the possible consequence. We want to be proud. And we down all along. And so these secrets, they create a boundary between the family and the outside of the world. They put pressure on each family member not to tell our secrets. The consequences of secrets. I'm going to end with this. The consequences of family secrets. We got taboo subjects. They tend to create strife in the family that we say we love. We got individual secrets that lead to isolation and anxiety. We got internal secrets that create factions and often put kids in the middle of parental issues. We got shared family secrets that create a sense of loyalty based not on a sense of connection but on fear. And we open up this door of fear to our children. We open up shame that the secret may be told. And so what we must do as a family, we must examine ourselves. And the way that we live our lives in front of our children, we need to come together, right? Start to assess and address the role of the family. So 2 Corinthians 1 3 says, It's blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. And so, what I want to say to you is that it is God that gives us comfort. It's God that give us strength. It is God that give us help. And in that fourth verse, it talks about us comforting others. And so our goal is to first be comforted by God. Hey, our Father, who is the Father of earth, who comfort us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those which are in trouble. Do you know anybody that's in trouble? Do you know anybody that's suffering? Do you know anybody that's going through something? Can you share with that person? Can you tell your testimony and the things that you've been through and how God brought you out? Can you cry with somebody? Can you weep with somebody? Can you come with those that are lost and are broken and feeling hopeless and helpless? Can you sit with your brother and your sister as they go through? Can you cry with them? Can you pray with them? Can you first get comfort by God then come with our brother? Hey. Hey. Hey, hey. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We bless you. We give you honor and we give you glory. Did this speak to anybody here? Raise your hand if you spoke to you. Cool. This spoke to the kid. That's good. That's good. That's good. We got two things we need to do. I need to do the offering. And I need to, we got something for Lisa. Y'all okay? Y'all all right? God made me a disruptor, y'all. <laughs> and it ain't fun. But we won't move on unless we start talking about it, right? When I talk about it, I'm not talking about it to attack nobody. 
or to down nobody or to deliver nobody, right? And so don't get the impression I'm telling you to go attack somebody. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I want you to get free. I want the burden to be lifted, right? The shame to be poured off, right? But you're going to have to be able to share what you've been through. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so this membership certificate is for Lisa Green, who officially who officially became a partner and member with us, right? Yes, yes, yes. And so she just said that she become a partner and a member with us. Uh, yeah, so you already been a partner, right? This piece of paper don't make you a partner. You knit it with us, you found it with us, and we love you. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody need special prayer? Okay. We do. Oh, you want to say it out loud? Okay. My bladder keep on enlarging and enlarging. Okay. Cool. We're gonna pray. Baby, baby, you want to pray for this bit? You want to type it? Oh, you want me to? Pray? Want to touch? Yeah. yeah. Father God, I thank you for our sister Debbie, oh God. Mm -hmm. God, we praying uh, for her battle right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. We declare that by your strength that she is healed, oh God. God, we believe in miracles, oh God. And so we're in expectation of a creative miracle, oh God, happening right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. We command by your authority, deliver the line up. Huh? To the body and function and operate how it's supposed to function, oh God. God, and if she has surgery, oh God, we pray that everything's successful, oh God, that she'll have speedy recovery, oh God, that there will be no backlash, no retaliation, oh God, but your hands will be in that room and in their bladder, oh God. And it's in Jesus' master's name that I pray. Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless you for every person that's under the sound of my voice, oh God. I pray that uh, the burden will be lifted. Uh, from the secrets that have been carried from years, oh God, upon your children, oh God, that they'll feel free to release those to us in a safe place with a safe person, oh God, that they may be healed, oh God. And so I'm commanded here, oh Lord God. I'm commanded the enemy to let them loose and to fear uh, be dismounted right now by the authority of Jesus Christ, oh God, and that a boldness will come that uh, cause them to open up their mouth and to be counseled in their soul and to be delivered in their spirit, oh God. And so it's in God that name I pray, oh God. I pray that you go to our households, you ride with us as we travel, oh God, that your spirit will be evident in our children and in our lives and in our marriages, oh God. And we give you glory and honor for this day, oh God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen.